Chapter 1 The Journey Begins Blinded by My Glory I was driving on a hot summer's day, my only companions a loud, frustrated life, a whining, disappointed self-righteousness, and faith, riding silent and back. As I drove, the road turned to water. I drove for hours and hours, chasing a mirage, but the water always stayed just before me. I could see it, yet couldn't reach it. I still haven't. Not yet. Most of us start our adult lives hopelessly selfish, as selfish as when we started our lives as children. But with the medications of social constraint or our fear of judgment and fellowship, we seem to control it. Or is it just hiding? In spite of all my efforts to outpace my selfishness, it always catches up to me. It won't die. I've tried to kill it, and I've asked God to kill it, but it remains. As long as I walk this road, it's the temptation that will accompany me, keeping pace with me as a constant companion. Occasionally I feel victorious in my fight against it, and it seems to leave, but only to wait for a better opportunity, to attack me when I'm weak with only imagined strength. My selfishness is a default position. When I don't choose to follow God, that choice defaults to my selfishness. Here in stage one, without God, loving myself for my sake is a most reasonable action. It's programmed into me. Some people live their whole lives in this default mode, blinded by their own glorious selfishness, unable to see the glory of God that surrounds them. But if we decide to follow God, our selfishness creates consequences, most of them bad. I'm beginning to see that if I let my selfishness have its way, it leads me to a lonely kingdom, which is no kingdom at all, just a king, me. And so our journeys begin. Everyone selfishly deceived. Everyone hopelessly proud. Are we there yet? It's this self-centered mindset that blinds us to misunderstand and soaks us with frustration on our journey. Even as adults, we continue asking like children, are we there yet? And we are not. How we deal with that truth is how we face this life and how we try to make things work. Everyone just wants to be happy, right? We try many things, including many things that harm us and others. And all the while, we're still on this road, traveling. This journey we share has a mystery that is not always enchanting and too often confusing. The uncertainties make it difficult. Some believe the road leads to nowhere. For me, it is a road to heaven, a road that stretches before me as it stretches my faith with doubt and questions my patience. I wrote the poem, Where the Road Turns to Water, during a stretch of patience-testing road, when I was feeling particularly frustrated, the promises of God felt like mirages, and my frustration led me to betray my truest longings. Blessed with exhaustion and mercifully wounded by futility, I could go no further. Where the road turns to water. Where the road turns to water, the sun meets the sea. Logic betrays, eyes deceive. Only love will prevail. Only love truly sees. My best havings are but my wantings. I reach forth with longing to where the road turns to water and the sun meets the sea. Oh, to see, to taste, to feel, but sensing. Mind and spirit outpaced. The road blurs with water. On knees knelt so drawn to remember a place only felt. See the sun meet the sea? My rainbow's end, love waits for me. Only love will prevail. Only love truly sees. Where the road turns to water. Like a psalm, this poem was a plaintive plea for rescue. It was heard by a merciful God whose promises are true, even if they are not yet. Where the sun meets the sea is where my Savior waits for me, not the mirage, but the reality. His love will prevail where the road turns to water. What road are you on? Who's waiting for you where the road turns to water? Authentic Contest in painting, there must be a contest for the positions of mass and space. Everything is being challenged, pushed, and defined by the other. Where they meet, the apparent lines are energized by this contest. The vying, overlapping, and winning of their positions is unifying. Without this contest, you have outlined objects, dismembered masses, and detached spaces. In life, there is a contest for our souls. Everything I consider good or bad is being challenged, pushed, 
and defined by the other. The vying, overlapping, and winning of their positions is challenging and unifying. The honest struggle makes us authentic. When I'm not truthful about my struggles, my life is inauthentic. My life is dishonest. And in that life detached from reality, I build fortresses to defend my fantasies. Anyone living in reality can see that I'm not truthful. I'm not just a bad witness. I'm a fantasy witness. I'm living amid fantasies that affect my faith by making God look like an escape from reality instead of a way into it. All along this road I travel, I see signs that seem to contradict each other. The distances and destinations are reversed. I'm surprised when I find the town of foolishness is on the way to wisdom, or that pride is so close and humility is so far away. This is paradox. It seems unlikely, if not impossible. But God makes it true. Joys and sorrows share tears. I find myself caught in the tension between what is and what could be while existing amid all the living out of the not yet. In that tension, I struggle to make choices, and those choices have consequences that sometimes create contradictions. I am sad to admit that because of sin, I have never purely loved God or people. I guess that would be both beautiful and sad, like seeing glimpses of heaven that somehow bring both bliss and torment, leaving me haunted by longing and full of regrets. Only by God's mercy have the redemption of those regrets and the fulfillment of those longings already begun. It's here, under the same roof, that my joys of thanksgiving and sorrows of repentance share their tears and call me home. It's also here that I offer my deepest thanks to God and man for the beauty I see and experience, and I offer my deeper apologies for the times I have needed forgiveness.